Awesome. I'm so excited. Thank you. Also, he's Dave's been nonstop hearing me talk about the show. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I'm still I talk about it all the time. Joseph and I go back and forth. It was incredible. Thank you. Yeah. It, it turned out good. Uh um and it was live like as in real live stream so there was a lot of extra stress just just kind of just kind of um not knowing if everybody got been able to log in you know or and you know all of these simple things and also you know if the if the stream would stop what we would do all of these stuff things that you don't that is kind of new when you compare it to real like pro, um, physical shows, but still at physical shows, there's stuff that can go wrong too. So, uh, but in the beginning, a friend of mine, he, one of the people, one of the guys that I brought with me to film, he said that when I asked him, he said that, no, we sh nobody's doing it live. Everybody's doing it pre-recorded uh, like a couple of days before or a week before or whatever. Um, so I was thinking about that as an option. Um, but I wanted to get that feeling of, you know, that feeling you get when you, you're at a show that, that it, this is real and it's now and it's, things can go wrong and, but that's part of the excitement about it. So I decided to do it live and, but, it, and it, and I also decided to kind of have some kind of, I wouldn't say proof, but have that live thing be part of how we acted. So I, I was actually, when I asked the other guys if the stream was actually working, I was actually asking, you know, if it worked. But I also knew that by doing that, it kind of gives everybody involved. It just reminds us that there are people out there watching, you know, yeah, and reminds the people who, who watched also to remind them that this is actually happening now. So that was, uh, was a fun, fun experience and it felt like a real show to me too um the same kind of adrenaline kick that you get and the same kind of down afterwards it's kind of like the magic's gone what do i do now you know <laughs> yeah it was at what was it the heavy water plant yeah and that's a historical building correct it is a very historical building it's uh I don't know when it was built, but it was it was there during the Second World War, and they they were making, I think they were making fertilizers fertilizers for the you know for farms and shit, um, and and the byproduct of that, they were making chemicals among the chemicals were fertilizers, and the byproduct of the fertilizers were heavy water, which is which is a, um, an isotope of water. It's the same H2O, but I think that the hydrogen atoms are a bit heavier. They have more, maybe an, another neutron or something. I, I'm not sure exactly what, what it is, but they, but uh, so that water, it, it looks like and tastes like ordinary water, but there's something with it that, that you can you can use that. You need that water in an atom reactor. At least you did back in, those days um, so to make an atom bomb you needed heavy water and of course Hitler wanted an atom bomb because if he got an atom bomb he would win the war so so I'm not sure if anyone else in the world made heavy water but this this factory when when Hitler uh, you know discovered that they were making heavy water there he occupied the whole uh, because they occupied Norway and then they occupied that factory and they, and they beefed up the amount of heavy water they produced. They probably only produced heavy water and didn't care about the fucking fertilizer, I guess. <laughs> uh, so they, uh, and then that was discovered. Uh, I'm not sure who discovered it, but you know, I think there was still people involved in the Norwegian resistance working in the factory as like, you know, informants uh, undercover so to speak so that the news that they were making more heavy water made the resistance hq in london uh, you know look into what the fuck's going on so they they kind of figured it out figured out that what was going on and then planned this um 
I think they spent a year trying to figure out or trying to stop this production. But the thing is that the production were, this was in, there's a building where they stored the heavy water that is now blown up. Uh, but they, they had heavy water in the building and underneath the building in the basement. So you couldn't, I think they had one sabotage mission that failed and then they wanted to, they considered bombing it, but they couldn't. First of all, this is in like a, in a valley. So when you fly over, you got too short of time to drop bombs. And if you did, it's hard to, to hit the factory. And if you hit the factory, it wouldn't help because the heavy water was below ground. So they had to go in manually, like with, with men, and sneak in and play, manually place bombs underneath the buildings. So they... So uh, I don't remember. There's a great. There's an old movie called um, Heroes of Telemark. Telemark is the area, and that's. I think it was. I think it's with, you know, one of the one of the. Uh, what's the name of the actor in? Uh, let me. Heroes of Telemark. <laughs> there's. There's this. There's this. Um, Born to be Wild song, which was a, a theme, uh, like a title song of a of a famous movie, biker movie. Do you remember that biker movie? Mm. And there is this there is this uh, actor in that one. This is this is a lot of links now, but I think we see. <laughs> I have to look it up, but I think I know which one. Kirk Douglas. Kirk, Kirk Douglas, Douglas yeah. is in the Heroes of Telemark. This is a movie from nine. 1966, 65. Um, so that, but there's a newer movie or series, like a six episode series, series called War of War, the War of the Heavy Water. I think it's okay. a Norwegian, Norwegian British, the Heavy Water War. It's a Norwegian British series. Really good. You should check it out. And it goes through all of this. All of these, you know, these different um, stages of the sabotage mission. So the, there was ten people, I think, that went into a hut in the in the mountain in Norway, and they lived there for a year total, I think, probably a lot of months before the sabotage action, and then they went back when they tried to escape from the from the Germans. They went. A lot of them went back there. Some went over to, to Sweden. To Sweden. There's a lot of, uh, like, this is a really kind of like a Star Wars kind of story. Like How did you maybe, get that venue? Uh, um, well, any venue, nobody, no venues now, they don't have anything to do, you know? This is a museum, but it's also possible to play shows there. So oh. from time to time, they have shows. There's no PA system. It's just like a huge room. There's more su suitable for acoustic, slow music. Um, but now that with the Corona stuff, even the museum stuff was closed down, at least when I when we organized it. So uh, a friend of mine, I, I play keyboards in Norwegian black metal man, band Emperor. So, and... Um, and the monitor guy in with Emperor, he he lived. Uh, well, Emperor is from that area. All of the guys and the monitor guy, he also knows the people who who owns the museum or works in the museum. So he came up with the idea, and I thought, Jesus, that's a really good idea. I didn't know about the how it looked. I just knew about the story and you know my associations uh, with the uh, factory. And so I thought that was a great idea. And when I saw the pictures of the huge, you know, machines and turbines in that room, I thought that that was a perfect, perfect mix for this particular album. So it would, you know, it was, it had links to Norwegian resistance. It had links to, you know, fight the fight against evil. It had links to the Second World War. It had, um, it was industrial. All of those ticked cool boxes when it comes to the Black Jazz show so um that was how it you know that came about sometimes you know a few times people come to me with ideas and they're really really good you know i know the ones that we in 2015 we played at the mountaintop like a mountain edge troll that it's was with the last day right 
Yes, we actually played a full show. I still have the full show. It's like a 35, 40 minute show. And I haven't, I still have the material and I have the audio track, like multi-track and the, but I haven't had time to, to go through and finalize the whole show. So it's kind of stupid, but I do have it all. Um, but that was also a local guy who suggested it. And, and I thought immediately that we should do that. So this was another one of those that just came, somebody else came up with the idea and I thought, I thought that it was a perfect idea. That was cool. Um, the <laughs> lighting, the sound. Yeah. When you say you want it to feel real, it was real. And it was funny reading the comments. Everybody's like, why am I so close to the TV? They're like front row, no tall guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no tall um, guys. Yeah. Uh, no, I, uh, yeah, it was the lighting and the smoke made that place look really cool so i'm really happy about it but at the same time it just feels like it's hard to it's hard to you know it's hard to do something like that again because you feel like you have to to make it better next time and it's probably not possible to make it better next time but maybe in a couple of times there's a new great idea you know um so uh, yeah, but it's uh, it looked really cool and everything worked as it should, uh, and I got the um, I got the audio tracks and the and the camera multi tracks. Um, I discovered actually that that actually both of the multi track recordings we had two ca two computers recording. Both of them had something. There was something wrong with both of the recordings. One of them stopped for half for half a minute. And the other one was missing the five last tracks, which was my vocals, Ishan's vocals, Ishan's guitars. And those were the important ones and some clean DI for possible reamp. Uh, so I was, when I discovered that, I was kind of like a little bit stressed. <laughs> so I had to piece it together, both of the projects. And I, and I, and I, I used the middle, I mean, the, the missing section from the from the session that had all the tracks, I used that. Uh, no, no, sorry, I had the beginning and the end from a pro project where that included all the tracks, and then I used the missing section from uh, from the project that lacked the last couple of tracks. But I, luckily, I didn't. There was no. Vo I didn't do any vocals, and Ishan wasn't on stage at that time. So I could piece it together, and the only thing I'm missing is one, one word from me where I say, okay, what? I'm just gonna re-record <laughs> that, and I have everything. So I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what kind of preparation went into to planning that show, and how long did you plan for it? I announced it the 8th of May, and at that time uh, I, had, I had already prepared quite a bit so that's at least a month pr probably um pro let me see if i can if i can let me see here i have probably can date it i guess six seven weeks wow uh let me see uh i don't have any yeah here we go Fifth of May. Yeah, I guess uh, six, seven weeks. I, I didn't know how to stream. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know how to stream, but I didn't know how exactly we were going to stream this thing, because we were, Shining did, a live stream show in. On the twenty seventh of March was pretty, pretty, pretty early after you know, things were closed down. We did, uh, we used, you know, we gathered five of our own cameras and we gathered these kind of, uh, uh, these kind of small USB connectors that you can connect the camera to, to a computer. And uh, we put up our equipment in, uh, in like our rehearsal room. Mm -hmm. We had a substitute drummer for that show. So just made a kind of do-it-yourself show, but with four or five cameras. Um, so that that was kind of like a 
preparation, but that was live uh, for free on Facebook. And people could donate money through PayPal and they could they could buy merchandise on our own merchandise uh, website and they could also donate through a Norwegian kind of uh, instant trans transfer service that you do with your phones. Um, and But for this show, I felt like we were kind of through the first phase of the corona pan pandemic. And in Norway, we had a lot of streaming shows, but I felt like we were at the point where it made sense now to not give it out for free. Uh, at least I felt that I didn't want, want to do that. And this was also partly because this was an old record. It's a 10-year-old record. It's more like an art project more than just a couple of cool rock songs. I didn't, it didn't feel right to me to, to, to give, it, give it out for free. Um, but still, I didn't know how we were going to do this old payment thing. You know, and this this guy from that helped me with the you know, the guy who who lives in that area and who helped me with the idea to to go here, he had an idea for, he had an idea for, uh, streaming and paying through a system that he had, but that wasn't up and running. So I just had to announce the whole thing before I knew anything, uh, and that kind of took a lot of time to, to just like launch it, sell tickets without knowing how they were going to get in. And with that, you know, I, there's a saying in Norway, I don't know if you have it, but don't sell the hide before you shot the bear, you know? Uh, yep, you, I get you, it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, this was like that. I was selling something and I didn't know how to, fix it you know i was selling tickets so and you know so that was part of the part of the planning and i had to i did all the i did all the design work i did all the posters and all the video all the video uh, promotion and i saw that when i posted shit on online i sold tickets and when i didn't post anything i didn't sell anything so i you know i soon figured out that i had to talk about this shit every fucking day so that was a big, that was a big part of the work. Also, just while preparing all this shit, while preparing, or going there to see the place, a planning light show, planning, you know, editing the video intro, organizing glitch video overlays during the way, organizing all of that stuff. I also had to do the fucking promotion every day. I needed to post something. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, my life for the last, it feels like my life, every single minute of those weeks just went into that project. So I'm kind of happy that I'm done with it, <laughs> especially <laughs> not having to post every single day about the same thing. <laughs> now for those who missed it, will they be, a, are you going to, um, come out with it later on? So whoever missed it can take a peek because whoever didn't they did the wrong decision <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i think um i think this turn turned out so good that i'm that it would be a pity if it wouldn't be available um uh, and that's also why i focused that why i had two computers recording the the audio so i knew that we were going to have something or i didn't know but i hoped <laughs> uh so we are i am gonna kind of make it available some way but I also have this. I there might there's a chance that this will be not free on YouTube at least for the first year or so. It might be might go into some kind of there's a, there's this pl streaming platform and uh, combined with kind of like a music concert archive like like a Netflix kind of thing. Like a combined thing that that the same guy who who are who are we're working with on this show, we're kind of working on this project and it's going to be announced in a couple of days, I think. So this show might go into that platform uh, and see and see <laughs> how that works. So that's a platform for future streaming shows for uh, for everybody, not only for us but for any band anywhere in the world. And also, it should be like a what you call it pay 
video on demand service in a yep. way. And then I guess after a certain time, I'll uh, kind of uh, put it out for free. That's usually, you know, what I do after a certain time. So we'll we'll see. And but first, I gotta work on it. I gotta. I'm gonna keep the same edit. That's the thing. Uh, this was done live, so and we, we needed to preserve the, uh, some CPU power for for the broadcasting machine. So we decided to not record it on the machine. So we just broadcast to to YouTube. So the file that I have is downloaded from YouTube, like the, the mixed file, uh, like the, uh, the video mix. Um, so I'm, but I'm gonna keep the same, the same kind of edit. I'm gonna have the guy who did the live edit, I'm gonna have him go through it and just redo the whole thing, but from the original material. So, so you get a higher resolution and better you know, picture, but still keep it as it was. And then I'll probably do a new mix, but it, it's gonna, not not something, not it's not going to be a drastic difference from from what it was, but it's going to just look better because the live encoding from YouTube has to you know has to work immediately. So it 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 needs to do some shortcuts. But if you upload it from a high resolution file, it just looks a little bit better. So that's the plan. But I took I've. It's five years since we played on that mountain, and I still haven't released it. So, <laughs> don't that, hold that your breath. That music video is cool. Um, yeah. So that one, if any of the viewers want to go on, they can go to YouTube and type "last day," and they will be able to see uh, the mountain. Yeah, and that that is also a very special thing because we that's as secluded as it gets. We had audience, but they were all walking, hiking up on their own two feet and it took five hours up and uh, three hours down. So the, uh, the audience just, they had to, you know, bring real hiking uh, mountain gear. Okay. And, uh, and to get all the equipment up, we had to fly it up by helicopters. It's no, no, no roads, no, no power, no nothing. So we, we brought up a power generator and everything up there. Um, so it's, um, that's a special one too. That's a hike I would have done. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so how would how would you decide? You started with the saxophone, and then how did you come with metal with it? Well, I um, I I when I was a kid, I listened to metal music. The first kind of music that I bought myself, or you know listen to myself that wasn't my parents music was rock and metal music so i'm not really sure why i started playing the saxophone because i didn't listen to saxophone music i listened to you know the first the first songs the first bands that i remember that i that i felt like me was pantera and death and sepultura and the swedish band entombed um so the link with sax was kind of I don't know uh, why, why that came about. Um, and then I, uh, uh, my, my musical horizon widened, so I started listening to you know, uh, more kind of progressive jazz oriented yeah, metal with more stuff in it, for instance, Dream Theater, and then and then, uh, you know, and then along the way, I started listening to hip hop music and all sorts of shit. Uh, but I still didn't listen to jazz music. But I was practicing my sax, and I remember practicing. You know, I was in my room practicing my alto sax with with Pantera's "Vulgar Display of Power" when that came out. <laughs> so I've been doing that for. I was doing that. For when I was about 10 years old, and when I was 30, I released Black Jazz. So I think I, I did that thing for. You know, it took me 20 years to f kind of figure out the way to incorporate sax playing with metal music in a way that I felt was um, natural or that, that sounded good, you know. So, but I, at a certain time, I kind of discovered jazz music that I actually liked. And then I went totally into the jazz world for 10 years, studied jazz music at the Norwegian State Academy of Music. I... Um, 
I, and then I studied kind of contemporary classical music and I kind of left the metal world for a bit. And then I started missing it and discovered, this was probably in 2000 and around 2005, 2004, 2005, as I discovered stuff that wasn't around when I was, that and when I was a you know, metal head kid, so like Dillinger Escape Plan, so no, you know, more of the, the newer generation of American metal music. Um, and then from there on, I, I discovered stuff that I never listened to when I was a kid, but maybe I should have, uh, like uh, Marilyn Manson and Nine Inch Nails and in, the industrial stuff. And the combination of all of these three things, the, 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 the jazz music from, well, the, the metal music from my youth, the jazz music from my, uh, from when I was 15 to let's say 25, and the newly discovered industrial music and a more artsy uh, metal music, those three elements came together. Um, so that's the story, how that came about. It's, how would you describe it to someone? Because when I, I have um, somebody at work and I said, hey, listen to this black jazz, and they were like, what is black jazz? Um, um i you know this is 10 years ago so i, I what i'm do, saying now is is a bit like regurgitating regurgitating stuff that i've it's not something i come up with now but i used to call it i used to call it I, I, for first of all i i used to explain the name of of black jazz by saying that it's there are two genre defining and basically genre defying albums too that are called one is uh, black metal by venom came out in 1980 or maybe a little bit before uh black metal venom came out 82 and then there's a record called free jazz by ornette coleman and that came out in 1960 or 50, 61. Uh, so, bo so both of these two are, if you take one part of, is this, this kind of, both of these albums gave name to, you know, a following um, musical genre. So half of the black metal name and half of the free jazz name together they kind of form the black jazz name. Um, and musically, it's also kind of the same. Half of the free jazz music and half of the black metal music together. But it, you know, it's also important, if you want to describe the music, you can, it's so important to mention that you got this industrial production thing to it, which is a big part of it. So those three elements, I think, would together be black jazz did you ever receive any negativity towards it yeah 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 a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah a lot um a lot in the beginning uh it's harsh like the music is harsh so there's a lot of people who don't understand and don't like it but there was also a lot of people who felt like we were i felt like it was gimmicky and felt like, like the sax part of it was just gimmick. And gimmick, now let's see what gimmick, gimmick meaning, the, the definition, the first comes up in, on uh, Google is a trick or device intended to attract attention, publicity or trade. But the thing with the gimmick is also that it should, it, it, it doesn't feel true. That's what I think that is what some people wanted to think or thought about Black Chest. They thought that it was a a gimmick that you just throw a sax at it and then you got something new and you get some attention. But then but after you know that kind of those arguments they died pretty pretty quickly because I think people understood that 
this was real and it was both of the both the metal side and the jazz side was both equally real from me it's not like i wasn't the metal kid who just discovered jazz and i wasn't the jazz kid who just discovered some metal and wanted to add some fuzz guitar to me both of these were incorporated in my blood for more than 10 years and was part of me and so but that was that was the the, the general if anyone was were negative and there was a lot of negative people towards us at that time that was usually the thing and also i think we saw a lot of the we saw a lot of the um, kind of defensiveness or the uh, the people who wanted to pre- the who wanted to preserve real metal on um untarnished in a way like clean they, they, we were kind of invading the metal territory and some people felt that you know they should that we should be pushed away because we were invading their space that's what i felt like uh but they they learn i don't hear that now so i don't know where they are maybe they're just getting gotten used to gotten used to it now i don't know who dug it, um, Who was a big fan of it when you first started? Any big name bands? Um, I'm, yeah, you, you said when this, when this record came out, when Black Chess came out in 2010? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, this was, it was uh, like a musician's kind of... Uh, record musicians uh, band i wouldn't say you know huge artist but uh, but there was a lot of kind of medium sized artists who who embraced it uh devin townsend was one of the first people who brought us on on tour and we had and we've been with him on t- several tours throughout from 2010 to 2015 um Danko Jones uh, uh um what's the name of the drummer in Slayer again uh, Dave Lombardo was uh, I didn't really speak with him directly but he posted about it online um you know that kind of you know those kind of artists we didn't have like don't jump on Jovi or you know that kind of people they didn't they weren't into black jazz i think <laughs> but i'm not sure i'm not sure if that was in the end if that was important i uh, but but it was you know a lot of people liked it because it was different you know and it was different who cool. um if you, I'm hoping once everything with this COVID goes back to normal, if you do plan to do another tour, who would be some people you would like to do a collab with? Like on the tour, like a package package tour, you think? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, there's so many bands that I like. Uh, the problem is uh i don't have a problem finding bands that i would want to tour with and that list is really varied you know it could be like now prodigy is you know probably stopped but it could be prodigy it could be Foo fighters it could be uh it could be danko jones it could be uh emperor it could be uh, you know Devin townsend works great it could be fucking queens of the stone age nine inch nails um, all of these are kind of bigger bands, but they're, you know, it's easier to mention these. Um, the problem is usually, uh, is usually the other way that we, uh, we, we've never really fit into a category. Uh, we didn't do it. We, we didn't fit into a category before black jazz. We didn't fit in a category after black jazz and with animal and new stuff, we still don't fucking fit in the category even though people you know when animal came out they were saying oh this sounds just like everything else and then now it's been out for two years and i still 
feel like I can't really come up with any bands that that are that sound exactly like that and that fits a, and I don't doesn't it doesn't bother me but it seems to bother uh, promoters uh, um, record labels managements because they they seem to like to have things that are really the same like you, if you take a look at any fucking gent tour the bands are really really similar they use the same fucking equipment the same guitars they sound the same this it's really defined thing and that was probably the same with it's been the same with a, a, take a look at a fucking black metal tour same thing they sound look the same uh same with any any of these kind of sub genres and and we've always kind of fallen between chairs so to speak um so you know like i said the list of bands that i would tour with is long could also be you know uh, carpenter brut some that kind of synth wave stuff um there's a lot of you know A lot of stuff, <laughs> but, it, we, but we, we've had a problem actually. I think we've had a big problem getting on any tours. I'm, obviously these bands are huge. So everybody, you know, everybody are having problems getting on those kind of tours, but it's still been surprisingly hard to get, to get package tours with us. And so we usually, end, we have usually ended up with just doing our own tours and bringing bands with us. So, um, so let's see, let's hope that changes. <laughs> do you um, hope to do a big tour once all of this is over or start with like some small areas? Uh, we have done a lot of our own tours, like I said, so it would be, I would love to go on a big tour. Um, and there's so many poss possibilities. So, uh, but there is another part of this now, which is different. And that is, it's much more risky now to go on tour um, than before. It, w it was risky then, you know, for instance, we went on tour with the Dillinger Escape Plan in Europe in, in um, 2000 and, 2017 I think we were doing two weeks of tour in Europe I think it was supposed to be Dillinger's last tour we, we had done the tour with Dillinger in the US in 2014 a month and then we we're supposed to do the two weeks the two last weeks with them in Europe we did two shows and the show and on the way to the third show on a highway in Poland um, we shining had our own bus and they had their own bus and their bus was hit by a by a semi truck from the back so the the trailer they had with equipment was was smashed and the and the bus got a good kick in the ass uh so they they uh, they got a big scare and they some of them you know bruised some bones i don't i don't think they broke anything but they were they were shook up um they went to the hospital to check up on them and they spent about three days figuring out what to do if they were going to do the do the rest of the tour or not and we also were just kind of had to wait around we didn't get any info from them we didn't get any info from their management we didn't get any our management, our booking agency didn't really get an info. We're just like stuck in nowhere land with a bus that cost a lot of money. And we, this was, um, this was uh, an investment from our side already. It was a support tour. We were, we got a small fee, but the, the costs were way higher than what we got in. But it was an investment we were planning on, you know, getting our name out there, selling some merch. Um, you know, getting some new fans. Uh, and when this got, got canceled, we had to buy tickets back 
So new tickets, we didn't get anything back from the bus company, from the airlines. Uh, I mean, obviously Dillinger had a hard time. They, but, and, uh, and they, you know, got all the attention obviously because they were the ones that got hit. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't know much about their, you know, what, what they, their economic part of it. And they, they, they got like, they had, they had fans, you know, with a, uh, like a crowdfunding thing that, that, that I think they got 20,000, 20 or 30,000 dollars or something. So to, to help them, um, and I hope they had insurance. I don't know. So obviously, you know, they, I am, they're also a bigger band than us, so, but it was hard for them. But the, my point is that even for us who didn't get hit, yeah, it, it, we lost shit loads of money on that. We, the, the, the fees that we're supposed to get, we didn't get those. We didn't sell any merch. We didn't get any publicity because we didn't do those shows. And uh, uh, so that almost kind of broke the band uh, uh, economically. We almost, we couldn't, we, we weren't sure if we could continue after that. Uh, we didn't get anything from the insurance. We didn't get anything from anyone. And uh, we managed to get through it. Um, so that can happen. And now with the Corona situation, it's even more risky. Because if you, if, let's say we were, we were confirmed for a four weeks tour with a big band. If it either Nine Inch Nails or Bring Me The Rise and whatever it is. And then we, invest in you know we 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 rent the nightliner we rent equipment uh, you know people say either take they uh, either they, they get off from work or they say no to other possible tours or shows and you go on that tour and you do one show and then corona fucking hits you know mm -hmm. or you got two weeks of tour in the middle in germany and germany locks down um it's just like really risky and it's, you know, the chances of getting hit by a semi truck on the highway in Poland is not really high, but the chances of something, some kind of virus outbreak happening now are pretty high, I think. Uh, so that's, uh, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure when I'm ready to, to take an economic risk like that again. You know, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I haven't figured out yet. Because I, I, can't, I can't, what? I think the live feed was a great idea though. That, yeah, that, that was probably a bunch of people's first concerts of this year. That was my first concert of 2020 and it was yeah. perfect. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good, but it's still just one show. And the thing with, uh, the thing with live streaming shows from my perspective, uh, my philosophy, and it's not an old philosophy because it's a new thing, so, but my current philosophy with streaming shows is that they would either have to be a different repertoire, like different music, or it would have to be a different production, location, scenery, stuff like that. So, or you could do both. Like we, the first show we did was was like a current modern set lists and it was in a like in our, our rehearsals room we had our lights with us and we you know we put our backdrops on the wall and so it looked kind of cool but it was that was how it was and the black jazz show was a different location different it was different production and different music we could possibly do like the black jazz show again at a mountain or we could do or we could theoretically do another time, another set list, new music on the same location. But so what I'm saying is that <clears throat> when you're on tour and you do 30 shows, you basically do the same show every night, mm -hmm. but different place, but it looks the same. You know, if you're, especially if you're a bigger band, you bring with you the whole fucking thing. So it's identical. Um, but with a streaming show, since they're since it's basically open for everyone you can't really do the same show every night for 30 days you got to do a new one and you got to come up with a new show so you it just takes longer 
you can't do as many shows. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of like the, that's the um, challenge with these shows. So it, it can't really, it can't really substitute the tour, I think. But it's less, it's less risky when you, when you look, you don't get, you know, you don't get run over on the highway, hopefully by doing a streaming show. <laughs> Yeah. Since the like COVID stuff and staying in, have you found any new music interests that you're into? Or new art artists out there? Since Corona hit, I haven't had time to do anything. I I thought I was gonna, you know, my springtime and my summertime was going to be like the my most uh, my most busy touring period ever in my life i was doing a lot of i was going to do a lot of shows with a with a, a side project band nightingal side project band called me and that man i don't know have you heard that band no not yet no, but so i i i played i played on uh, on one song on the new record and then like and then we have a video out uh, but i was going to be part of the band like on every song on that on that tour it was a two weeks tour in poland uh one week in russia and a bunch of festivals and i was going to do a bunch of festivals with emperor um and it was going to do some shows with shining both new shows and also the blast jazz anniversary shows but everything everything was cancelled and i thought that i was going to have a lot of free time but then the, a lot of stuff com comes with the corona cancellation. It's a lot of, you got to deal with insurance companies, you got to deal with flight companies, trying to get some money back. Uh, and I, I also kind of, um, I also spend more time focusing on the merchandise website that I have. And I started it myself, so I'm doing everything myself. So I, I'm sending, you know, focusing more on the re-release re of the Black Jazz record, sending those out. And then doing the first streaming show was kind of, you know, it took a lot of time. And then with this show, it took even more time. Um, so I haven't had any time, unfortunately. I haven't, I haven't heard any new music. But now, finally, <laughs> I'm back. And I'm planning on writing new music now. So it's a great time to, to listen to new music. I'm excited because now, now there'll be something to look, look for with you guys. Right, yeah. How is the everybody in the band doing with the whole writing process with new new content um oh no my bass player we him and i we are the ones that are writing together now i used to be the only one who wrote music it's been like that since the beginning uh but with animal he started getting more and more involved so at the end of that period we we're kind of doing 50 50 of the music i was doing the vocals and the lyrics and stuff but He's really involved and he's involved in, you know, in strategic choices. And, you know, if I'm wondering, should we do this or should we do that? I always call him. So we're kind of like a partnership on, on the writing part of it now, which I love. Um, but we, we are, we're the ones that are writing music. The other ones are, are not doing that. And I think that's, yeah, that, that works for us, and that, that also seems to work for most people. I think, I think there are more bands or artists, at least the ones who survive for a long time. I think they're usually not a f like hundred percent democracy. If five people having equal say, usually one or two people who kind of, you know, are the the motor behind the the stuff. Yeah, so so that's how it works. How did you come with uh, meeting everybody in your band? Ah, uh, well, we've had a lot of different people in the band. So it's been and and now with coronavirus, it's been even more crazy because our guitar player, our current guitar player, he lives in Helsinki, um, and he can't travel now, and we can't get him into the country. So the first streaming show we did, we didn't have a guitar player so we he recorded his guitar at home 
and he recorded videos and we just kind of like synced up the video and had him playing yeah. along. Um, um, but that was like pre-recorded stuff. And for this show, he was supposed to be part of it. But also because of the travel restrictions, we decided it was too risky to, to you know, announce the show, sell tickets, and then suddenly he's on the plane and then he can't get in, stuff like that. So we had our old guitar player on the streaming show now, on the Black Jazz show. Um, we had our old drummer also. Uh, so, so right now it's basically, it's turned out to be a lot of people and they're all around, well, they're not all around the world, but they're spread out. Um, and, and, and my relationship is good with all of them. So I think hopefully when, you know, this Corona thing lands and we can get back together, we'll, we'll get like a more stable, this is the band, you know? Uh, but, 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 you know, we, before Corona, we were five people and they, and they were, they were friends of mine, but you know, they're, none of them have been in the band very long. I think, Eric has been the one in the band for the longest and he's been with us since 2014, something like that. Um, Tobias, who, who played with us on the Black Jazz show, he's been with us since 2013, but then he quit the band in 2019 so we've had a couple of different drummers the last year so it's it's kind of changing and then like you see now we were back to an old iteration of the of the band so it's kind of a bit fluid <laughs> <laughs> were you able to read some of the comments from the live stream yeah uh, not along the way but they're still there i uh, i was actually i thought they were gonna be deleted after two hours but they're still there so it was kind of, it's kind of fun to see. <laughs> I was laughing at a, a couple of them. Um, I have, uh, I just jazzed my pants. <laughs> Need more sacks in my life. Yeah. And uh, my favorite one was Lisa Simpson is rolling in her grave over how good the saxophone is. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, uh, you know, I love our fans. They're they're really. I've I've come to know a lot of our fans throughout the years, um, and and they're you know they're really nice, cool, fun, smart people. Uh, I I don't you know I don't know everyone personally, but I do know a lot of them, and I see you know a lot of. I really appreciate you know people sticking with us, so I can kind of I meet them. If I'm on Twitch or I meet them at a show in Italy or I meet them at the, you know, like this. And, you know, I get to kind of see these people and, and there's a lot of cool humor among you know, our fans. So I, uh, I really appreciate that. And I, I see, I see our fan base growing and I see now I see more of a positivity again, because after Animal came out, people were, uh, you know, some people were really, you know, pissed off. Some people were unsure what was going on. Some people maybe thought that that I was kind of distancing myself from black jazz, and, and they liked it so much. So they, some people, kind of felt like it was like a a personal attack on them, and and it was it was. A, chaotic confusing mom period for a lot of people well i had been through that period because i'd made the record and uh, and when it came out it was it wasn't new to me you know that's that's how things work i put out an album and people maybe i put out a single and people say no no, no shouldn't do that and as if i just put out the single and i waited and i'm still waiting to finalize the album but when a single comes out, usually the album is fucking done, you know, and it's been done for nine months. So, but now I see we worked our, worked through that confusing period. People have come to see Animal for what it is, like a, a serious, they've kind of, kind of, they they've dove through the surface and see and seen what's below. It's not just a fucking party record it's like serious sad stuff underneath um and it's been it's come out of the 
the saddest and kind of more most intense and in many ways worst part of my life also so it's like a really personal heavy thing um and now i see that you know our fan base is growing people are really positive they some people like new stuff some people like the old stuff some people like it all and everything is just like uplifting and fun so that's really fun to see i i love that do you have any questions dave <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just kind of just going along listening. Um, when you guys decide to come back around and when COVID breaks and we can get back to life, are you planning on coming to the States at all? Are you going to stay over there? Um, it is expensive to tour in the States. It's expensive to go there. It's expensive to, uh, to travel around. The fees are low. Um, but, and there's a but here, and I'm getting some numbers for you. Um, where is it? It seems like the U.S. is growing pretty rapidly for us. I've been surprised because we haven't focused on the U.S. In 2000, after our last tour in 2014, I saw that it was too expensive for us to have both to both tour in the U.S. and lose money, and tour in Europe and lose money. So I said we can't do this anymore. We have to. We have to get Europe up and running to be able to earn money in Europe before before we go and play in the US again. And let me see here. But what I've seen is that and since then we haven't focused on the US. We you know, we've played in Europe and we've everything has been, you know, focusing in around Europe. But if I see if I look at the sales on our merch store because I'm doing all of the, mer the merch stuff myself. So I have all the numbers and I see that United States is, is on, it's, you know, it's a tied second place. We sold a lot in Norway, but United States is number two yeah. and it's pretty close to Norway. When it comes to, and it's above Germany and above United Kingdom and everything. And anyway, when it comes to Spotify, we got around 27, 28,000 monthly listeners in Germany and 25,000 in, in the U.S. And it's, it's growing. So wow. the U.S. is a place, obviously, if you, if you, if you come, if you add all the European countries together, you know, it's a bit, it's a higher number, but the U S has been surprisingly good, especially when you think about the fact that we haven't been there for five years, six years. Just <laughs> Those are some pretty good yeah. numbers for not coming back from not being here for that amount of time. Uh, yeah. So it may, it would have made, I mean, it makes sense for us to go to the U S but it's still a, an economic thing that we have to kind of, you know, so I don't know. I I hope we will. Um, yeah. So it, it all comes down to money right now, and Corona doesn't really help. And also, to tell you the truth, Trump doesn't help either. No. Um. No. Um. And this is not only about you know if I like him or not. It's also he's. Um. South by Southwest this year was canceled, but South by Southwest last year it was really hard for artists to get a lot of art, a lot more artists than usual got stopped on the uh, on the on the airports and sent back. Um, and obviously, when we tour in the U.S., we have visas and shit ready. But the whole attitude, even though Trump said that, you know, I don't know when he said it, but he 
he was kind of like saying that every country in the world is shitty except Norway. He didn't say that, but he said something like, there was something like that. He was like happy with Norway. But still, the attitude that he gives against the rest of the world, uh, it, 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 it affects the, the, how the border control people are acting. And it, it gives this, just, it, it adds to the hostility and and also the risk when you go there there's always a risk that somebody says that no fuck you you're not coming in even though you have the papers ready mm -hmm. stuff like that so it's just the whole thing is just a little bit it's a little bit uh, uh you know a little bit risky and obviously a co any country that that has corona under control is less risky to tour in just because if if there's an outbreak then you got to cancel your tour so i don't know it's a, i'm i'm kind of i've said it a lot of times now but it economically it's really risky now to tour and it's mm -hmm. even riskier in the us so i just hope that we'll get past this and i don't know i hope i don't think it'll happen but i hope that there will be a system maybe Maybe there will be insurance companies who maybe can come up with insurances that work for smaller bands that you can insure a tour. You can say that I want to insure this tour for this amount of money, let's say forty thousand dollars. I want to insure that this that's the kind of like that's the risk we're having, that's the expenses we're having. And if it gets cancelled, that's the money we need to get back. And then the insurance company would should have a pre you know, calculated formula and they say, okay, you want to insure it for $40,000, then you got to pay 3% to us or so whatever it is. I don't care what it is, but if they have, if they've already kind of prepared that system, then smaller bands could do this kind of uh, insurance because I, I went, I talked to my insurance company. I talked to the insurance company that, that is providing insurance for the musicians union in Norway. Like, a lot of musicians and then uh, probably talked to some other insurance companies too. When we got home from the Dillinger Escape Plan tour and I understood that nobody's giving us any money. Uh, and I said, I asked them if, if for future tours, if there was any insurance we could take that would cover this kind of stuff. And it wasn't. And I asked our musicians union to talk with their in insurance company to, to, to make such an insurance for one thing is giving it to one band. But if, if they would give it to the whole organization, I don't know how many musicians, but let's say 20,000 musicians, then they could, they, could, it's, they could like calculate the average and they can make sure that they earn money on it. But right now there's no insurance like that. But if, if that comes along, then it would be safer because it's not a problem for the band who doesn't get into trouble, but it's a big problem for that single band that, that, gets into trouble it's the end of the it's the end of the line for a band like that so we'll see <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you sure. do a mountain one that would be i would definitely travel and hike that that would be cool and be well <laughs> that that mountain that mountain show is probably the last time that will ever happen on that mountain because after we you know, the part of the reason why we got asked to do that show was that they, the local area, they wanted to, they wanted more tourists, basically, I think. So they wanted some attention, you know, because it's a, it's a landmark, it, it looks amazing. So they just wanted to, you know, get some activity. Um, and we did that show. I'm not saying it's our, you know, we did uh, i'm not saying it's uh, it's, uh, it's because of us but the year after they got so many tourists that they couldn't handle it it's just that whole thing is blown up so they've had to you know cut down they, first the problem was that there was you know tourists and they didn't have the proper mountain equipment or mountain shoes or whatever so they got stuck in because mountain is like a a risky treacherous place so suddenly the weather can change like that and then you're stuck um 
So they had to, they, they didn't have enough emergency personnel to deal with all the tourists. And then obviously, I guess there's trash trouble and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, uh, so, and also two weeks later, a student died, fall, fell, fell off the <laughs> cliff. And it's 2,000 feet down. So you're dead if you fall off. So, uh, so it's uh, not going to happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Rightfully so. <laughs> yeah. 